like it was Thanksgiving unless there was turkey and, and you know, some pumpkin pie or some, uh, some mashed potatoes. You know, it just feels un-American if you don't have those things. So as Americans, though, we tend to kind of kick things up a notch a little bit. We tend to, you know, kind of go ahead and, and say, well, how can we do this one better? You know, it's kind of like, well, I've got this smartphone, but it doesn't do this other stuff. I need a smarter phone, you know, so we've got to upgrade things. So later on, we ended up with the turducken. Now, how many people are familiar with the turducken? Maybe about half, okay? Um, for those of you that aren't initiated with the beauty that is the turducken, by the way, this is the best picture I could get. I looked at probably dozens and dozens, and they were all, let's just say, not appetizing. But this one, I think I got this from a website that actually sells them already made, so they actually put some money into the marketing. It's probably not even real meat. You know, it's probably plastic or something. But um, anyway, that was the best I could find. But here's a little bit of a diagram of what a turducken is. See, in layman's terms, you've got chicken inside of a duck inside of a turkey. So you've got like this three-layer casserole of carnage, you know, all wrapped up on a plate. And, you know, you slice through and you get like this big slab of three different kinds of meat. So it's kind of funny how um, I was thinking as, as an American, I was like, well, what if you kick that up a notch? Then, you know, you've already got three things. I mean, how ridiculous can you go? And apparently someone else had already thought of this. This is a comic I found where the lady says, it's chicken flavored tofu, tofu inside duck flavored tofu, inside turkey flavored tofu. And, and then the caption says, Alice became the first person in history to be beaten to death with a vegetarian turducken. <laughs> because I was thinking, you know, we've got turkey, then we had the turducken, and then what if you made a tofu version? Because you've probably heard of tofurkey the tofu turkey for people who are vegetarians. So someone else had already thought of it, and they made a tofurducken, and it's exactly what's in the comic. You've got actual, let me see, I think, oh, I've got someone's comments here who saw this online as well, and I agree with him. He said, my wife just got me a chicken salad, except the chicken turned out to be tofu. Somehow this spawned a chain of thoughts that ended with me deciding to see if someone else has already done this. Most of the awesome, seemingly unique ideas I have turn out to be not so unique. I'm glad that you beat me to it. You saved me the trouble of figuring out where to get three fake birds. It looks pretty good, too. So it's this roll with you know, three different kinds of meat in there. The point that I'm trying to make is that we tend to get to the point of ridiculousness. We take something that really is good, something that's simple, something that, that's, uh, I, I think you could even say it's pure. I mean, the whole turkey mashed potatoes thing, you know, that's kind of a pure Americana thing, right? And, and we like to complicate things. Well, how can we get more creative? And that's good. I like creativity. I'm doing it again. I'm doing the seasick thing. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to try to sit still. <laughs> but I think there's a real value in simplicity. And uh, it's one of the spiritual disciplines. If you get a book about spiritual disciplines, you know, there's prayer, there's fasting, there's meditation. Um, there's also simplicity. Simplicity is one of the spiritual disciplines. Um, so I found a couple quotes here that I thought were kind of appropriate. Da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I thought that was kind of nice. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Longfellow said, in character, in manner, in style, in all things, the supreme excellence is simplicity. You see, I have trouble with simplicity myself because I feel like I have enough energy to deal with some layer of complexity. Maybe you're the same. You know, if something's too plain vanilla, we, we add something to it. We put chocolate on top. We put, you know, peanuts and, and, and a cherry on top. We try to do something to make it more interesting, right? That's why it's a discipline. It's a matter of trying to pare down to what's most important. Tolstoy said, there is no greatness where there is no simplicity, goodness, and truth. See, in business, there's this interesting idea, and I, I'm going to try to tackle this. I'm probably going to botch the idea. But there's simplicity on the near side of complexity, and then there is simplicity on the far side of complexity. And what I'll, I'll, let me try to give you an example. Let's say someone is going to teach you how to, I don't know, what's something complicated you might do. Someone's going to try to teach you how to crochet. 
and if you already know, pretend you don't know how. Um, <laughs> from the beginning, when you first hear about it, you think, I don't know how to do this. This is complicated. It's, someone's going to have to teach me how to do it. Uh, you know, there, there's certain tools involved. There's certain ability. I mean, I, there's probably certain loops or knots or something. I don't know any of that stuff. And it, you know, it kind of comes at you as this is a little bit overwhelming. Then you go through the learning process and you actually start to get down those little steps. You start to understand and appreciate, okay, this is what it's all about. You go through these phases. I know what I don't know. Now I know most of what I need to know. You get to the other side and it becomes simple again, where it's like, oh, this isn't so bad. I can do this in my sleep. And so we shoot for the simplicity on the far side of complexity. So it's a matter of when you learn something new, after a while it becomes really easy. I was watching a TV show recently and there was a guy um, who had this, uh, he had some brain damage and he had to learn to do something, this really complicated task in under six minutes. And so his boss said, how are we doing on that project? And he said, I'm down to seven minutes and 20 seconds. He said, that's not good enough. He said, but that's with my bad hand. Both hands I'll do is fine. So he had practiced it so many times that he was gonna be able to do it in just a flash. And uh, his boss had been trying to make a point that when you do something with muscle memory, you don't even need to think about it. It's just a matter of, you know, your brain follows your body in a sense. And there you have the simplicity on the far side of complexity. Um, let's look at a quote from Steve Jobs. That's been one of my mantras, focus and simplicity. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. I'm gonna read that again. That's been one of my mantras, focus and simplicity. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. I want to read this passage from Luke. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with it. Uh, Luke 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work myself? Tell her to help me. Now this cracks me up because this woman is telling Jesus Christ to tell off her sister. I mean, that just blows my mind, but that's okay. <coughs> tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one, being Jesus, right? Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, is it just me, or does this sound like Thanksgiving dinner preparations? <laughs> I'm running around out here. You can almost hear the pots and pans clanging, can't you? It's just like, well, I'm trying to cook for enough people, and this is going to be cold. I'm trying to keep this warm, but I ran out of room in the oven. And now I'm trying to put something in the microwave. Will you warm those up and put those in the toaster? But wait, where's the butter? I need the butter out there because that's got to be soft by the time we get the rolls better. And then it's just, like, oh, my God. Goodness, let's calm down a little bit because you know these become so complicated. And then it's funny, even beyond that, you end up with all these other issues that can get in the way. Um, see, this is what I, I kind of think that Satan has a little bit of fun with Thanksgiving because it is an opportunity for us to actually focus on those few things that are important. So let's see if we can complicate it and get everyone distracted. So if I had to guess, I would say that these are some things from Satan's playbook. I would think if he was taking the thanks out of Thanksgiving, he would say, cause so much difficulty with the food that everyone's too tired to give thanks. Did you ever notice by the time all the preparations are ready, it's like everyone's exhausted and famished and the turkey took too long and the stuffing wasn't cooked right. So just hang on and play Scrabble for another minute. We'll have dinner. Just calm down, eat a bite of an apple or something. You'll be fine. But everyone gets so tired that, you know, it's like, well, okay, we don't want to give thanks now. I mean, shoot, it'll be tomorrow before we have dinner. Cause family bickering and discord so no one's in the mood to give thanks. You know, it's not just your family or anyone else's family. It's 
humanity. When we get a group of people together, it's really easy to get grumbled and upset and have that ingratitude syndrome that we were just hearing about. I mean, the character Doc played is funny because he's, it's not like you've not met someone like that before, right? I mean, and to be true, to be honest, most of us have shades of him in us too, don't we? Football game doesn't go the way you want. Um, you know, the, the turkey doesn't cook the way you want. You, anything. I mean, it takes the slightest things to set us off. And if you're like me, sometimes changing gears emotionally can take a while. Did you ever notice, like, if someone kind of sets you off down the wrong path, it's not easy to just turn around and then be all cheerful? I don't know, for some reason it's like, I like to be true and, and, and solid, and I don't like to be wishy-washy. But that's one place where it would be okay, isn't it? If I got upset, it would be good to just flip and then be happy again. But no, it's like, no, I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm gonna stay unhappy for a good few hours, and maybe I'll take a nap and reboot, and then you know, maybe then we'll see about being better. But see, once we get off on a track like that, it's hard to kind of switch sometimes. Now maybe some of you have a, a better handle on that, and you'll need to teach me how you do that. Um, make everyone afraid to talk about their personal lives and give thanks. See, if you're like me, you've been to many Thanksgiving meals where you skip over that whole, what are you thankful for piece. I mean, maybe you've actually been to, at, at most of them where people kind of share those things. But I've been to many where, for whatever reason, that doesn't happen. And I think that that's an important part that we ought to not lose. Otherwise, we ought to just call a spade a spade and call it Turkey Day. I mean, if we're going to call it Thanksgiving, we ought to give thanks at some point. So my suggestion is that we actually make time to do that. So if we were to put the thanks back into Thanksgiving, I would say make it an actual priority. We actually think about what we're thankful for ahead of time. I mean, it's just a matter of, you know, kind of like what um, Charlotte's prescription was, you know. Think of two things that you're happy about for the, whatever it is that, that's got you upset. Or actually kind of think ahead and say, okay, these are the things that have got me upset, but on the other hand, I've got all these other wonderful things going right for me. And like I said, you know, when people get hungry, they get grouchy. So I would say don't hold up the meal, but start conversation with it. You know, serve the turkey, serve the potatoes, include everyone, but then make that part of the discussion. Full license. I mean, we don't need anyone, anyone's permission to start asking the question. I think we're all used to it coming up on Thanksgiving in some form or another. Don't hold up the meal. I, how many people have worked in a kitchen before, like a, an institutional kitchen, like a, a cafeteria or something? Yeah, okay, at least half. You know that it doesn't matter how Christian someone is, when they get hungry, they get cranky. So you don't want any cranky people on your Thanksgiving feast. So give everyone their food and they're fine. It's the same thing with the mission field. There's this idea of rice bowl evangelism where you know, do you, you want to present the gospel to the local people in whatever country you're, you're, you're reaching, but then what do you do as far as food is concerned because typically they're very poor and they don't have what they need. So the idea is, well, if you feed them first, well, then they might not stick around for the message. Yeah, but if you don't feed them first, then they're all hungry waiting for you to shut up so they can get to the food. So I say take care of the physical needs and then let the brain engage. And it's kind of the same way here. Remember that every good and perfect gift comes from God, James 1.17. Now this one is funny to me. I don't know if you have the same kind of debate, but do you ever have Satan kind of whispering in your ear, did God really do that? Because that just seemed like luck to me. You know, there are some coincidences where it's like, you know, wow, that's great. There's only one Pop-Tart box left on the shelf, man. That, that's not God, though. That's just, you know, that's me. And there's any little thing, it's like, well, God doesn't care about the little details in my life. So, you know, that's just got to be coincidence. But if God provides for us in every way and made the things that make the Pop-Tarts, I'm not especially a fan of Pop-Tarts. I'm just throwing that out there for you. <laughs> I mean, they're good, but um, it becomes a discipline to see everything as coming from God. I don't think that comes natural to us. I don't think, you know, we, we receive things, every good thing, as if it came directly from the hands of God, but I think that James says that it does. I mean, in one way or another, everything we have actually comes from God. And last, it's better to be a Mary than a Martha. 
And again, well-known stories have the potential to just kind of gloss over us. Yeah, yeah, I know that story. You, she should have spent more time with Jesus past the cheesecake. You know, it's just a matter of let, let's just go right over it. But I see this as something that we all face over and over again throughout our lives. I mean, I do it as well. We complicate things. We make things difficult. When Jesus is saying, this is the most important thing, spending time with me. All of this other stuff does not even come close by comparison. So when we participate in a holiday like Thanksgiving, it's part of our culture. It's part of who we are. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you read through the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is tons of culture and tradition. This is what our people do. This is part of our identity. But our culture as Christ followers is to be identified with Jesus. And Jesus was always giving thanks. Jesus was always thinking of others. Jesus was always focused on his mission and who he is. And that's where we get to really take a holiday like this. Usually we're not working, we're not you know, doing some of the normal things that have us all tied up and messed up with our complicated lives. Instead, we get to actually pull back and focus on what's important, on God, on our relationships, on our family. And we get to actually support and encourage each other. It, we get to this point of just kind of stuffing ourselves with food, and then we get to Black Friday where we stuff more stuff in our houses, right? I kept seeing these, these funny pictures online about um, show a kid with a really quizzical look, and it would say, you mean to tell me that people trample each other 24 hours after being thankful for what they already have? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's not quite right. So. The idea of simplicity really brings us back to what's most important, Jesus. Well, what do we do with Jesus? Well, we spend time with Jesus. There are lots of, uh, lots of interesting devotionals that really bring us back to that. It's not about necessarily praying or fasting or, or all of those things. It's about just spending time with God. And the easiest way you can do that is just to be thinking about Him, just be thinking about God. What would Jesus do if he were in my shoes, if he were in this conversation? And we'll get chances to do that. I mean, when you see relatives you haven't seen in a while, you're gonna hear all kinds of stories of, you know, well, I, I got divorced, or, or I lost the house, or I lost the car, or I was in an accident, or I was hurt, or those kinds of things. Those are chances to really be supportive and to be Jesus to someone else. Since, you know, say, I'm listening, I'm really here for you, I'm sorry to hear that, what can I do to help? So it's really an opportunity to give, again, coming back to the importance, the relationship and our identity with Jesus. So really that's just the point. I don't want to make it complicated in a sermon about simplicity. I really just want to point to Mary and Martha and the idea that we can all be both people. But it is better to be a Mary. And so the idea then for this coming weekend and really for the next six weeks Barbara and I talk about how it's almost like you would ought to just tear the last six weeks of the calendar off, you know, because you can't really accomplish so much. It's like, hey, do you want to get together? Oh, I've got the holidays. <laughs> and it's almost like you're carrying around this big anchor, you know. It's like, well, I'd love to see you, but I've got the holidays. <laughs> We've got all this planning and all this running around, but in the course of that, try to keep it simple. Try to keep it focused on Jesus and come back to what really counts, and that's God's love for us and our love for him. Will you pray with me? Father, we do pause now to give you thanks, to thank you for the incredible life that you've given us, the incredible blessing of knowing you, of being able to come to you through Jesus, our high priest, of being buoyed and supported and blessed by the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives. Father, we thank you for every good thing that you've given us. We thank you for all the good and perfect gifts. We ask that you would bolster our faith and help us with our unfaithfulness. Those parts where we don't see you, Father, show us where you are. And Father, when we meet with someone who needs encouragement, who needs love, who needs to see how much you love them, Father, please give us the words 
give us the, the heart, give us the love to show those other people so that they can then see your love and then get a closer relationship with you because that is what's most important. Our relationship with you is all we have. When all is said and done, there will be no turkey, no Thanksgiving potatoes in the same way we have today. It's going to be a matter of you and us individually. Help us to remember that we'll spend eternity with you, but we also get to spend our lives now with you as well. So Father, we ask for your help on our hearts and minds, and that you would use us as vessels of peace and love for those around us. And we do thank you so much for the food you give us, the clothing, the shelter, the warmth, and your love. We thank you, Father. We can't thank you enough. Thank you for everything. We praise you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.